If you look like you're idle, <laughs> and if you look like you're disorderly, they'll pick you up. That was a favourite charge that the police would use to pick us up. In most cases, the offenders are Polynesians, but the areas in which we operate are mainly Polynesian areas. Well, I think my primary complaint is that the task force is racist. I was not consulted by a lawyer. The police told me to plead guilty. The whole room was full of Pakis telling me what to do. At the age of 13, all I said was guilty. There was this pipeline from a kid being picked up for waiting for a friend on Queen Street, being put in police cells or prison cells for days on occasion, and then ending up in this welfare home. They're predominantly Māori or Pacifica. Most people just had not heard of this. They were lovely kids. They weren't little criminals. And they were not to be written off, and I wasn't going to write them off. Nobody was looking. Nobody was looking when the eight-year-olds were dragged through the courts to face some charge or another. At the New Zealand Race Relations Conference, the crowd was basically white. So here comes Oliver. You know, he was a real skinny, tall, you know, looking like a professor type number. My first impressions of Oliver is Puta Mohi or Pākehā, of being a know-it-all Pākehā. Both Ngā Tamatō and the Polynesian Panthers were there. You know, they were a pretty intense bunch of individuals. You know, Pākehā were, I think, a little bit alarmed at them. Really strong personalities. I didn't know those guys or how influential they were in the civil rights movement as it was in New Zealand. We've made to this effect over the past... I'd come from Nelson and presented this paper with these results, which were stunning results. I mean, these data were impeccable in showing that the Pākehā system was a racist system. And then Will stands up and Sid stands up and a whole lot of Afro-haired Polynesian Panthers stand up. In street terms, I basically stepped them out and just said, hey, look, racism is not our problem, it's your problem do something about it. They issue this challenge and say, well, your results are fine, but what the fuck are you going to do about it? That was a really powerful moment. And it was very, very uncompromising. And they stood back and said, now, what well, do you go away and do it? A group of us got together and worked out um, how we might form ourselves into an anti-racism group. The Auckland Committee on Racism and Discrimination became a CORD, and it was a good acronym, really. There were about 10, 10 or a dozen, I suppose. Uh, it included a couple of lawyers, uh, David Longy, uh, Robert yeah. Ludbrook, and of course there was my wife, Ulla, Ryan Missy Nairn, and people like me and Ross Galbraith, uh, entomologists. They were crucial because they stood up and made statements on their own. You know, it was like a real good ally we started fairly major campaigns to investigate, expose, and bring about change in the racist systems that the country was based on. It changed my people, my elderly people, to started to realise. When they saw Balangis of high note like Dr. Oliver Sutherland, you know, obviously I thought he was a medical doctor, but you know, I didn't want to tell him that he was a doctor of ants, but you know what I'm saying? He worked with insects and you know, little creatures and he'd meticulously pick apart. Having a mind like that, you know, he'd apply similar things to humans. He meticulously recorded everything that he did, every encounter, every interview, and he will latch on to an issue and just bore into it like a PhD student. Oliver started to talk about some of the cases of kids that were in prisons. For children in the courts who weren't bailed, they had to be held somewhere. So if we look at Mount Eden, where something like 150 children a year were held there um, for, for days, if not for weeks on end, they were in shared cells which had no plumbing, sharing toilet facilities, which was a bucket in the corner in the same cell where you had your meals. And in fact, the superintendent of Mount Eden Prison did a deal with me and would ring me and say, we've got a boy in here. And during my lunch hour, I shot down from work and I'd bail him out. And I'd take him and he'd come and stay with us. And then he started talking about the well, which is this cell under the floor. And it used to be where they held the condemned inmates that when, before they got hung and they'd put kids in there. 
It was just totally, totally inappropriate for children to be held in those situations. The judicial system in those days would prosecute eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds for, for vagrancy, for being idle and disorderly, for being a rogue and a vagabond at the age of 10. When a child is uh, placed in the care of the Director General of, uh, of Social Welfare, uh, he has authority above all others. You know, through his networks, he hears of the psychiatric hospital where children were being sent to, and they're being electrocuted. He told me about Hake Alo's case, um, how he was taken from school, and, and because of a language barrier, he ended up at Lake Alice. <laughs> He was getting shock treatment. It was being used as a punishment. I didn't know how to speak in English then. I didn't understand anything. They would get these electrodes um, that had been soaked in salt water and they'd be applied. And then they would proceed to fry the shit out of these kids. Um, to put it mildly. The pain is very bad. It's just like being whacked. Your head had been whacked by the sledgehammer. There were children from the age of nine went to Lake Alice. They were being given shock treatment from the age of nine. Kids would be in absolute catatonic fear because they didn't know if they were going to be next. Children just defecating, urinating before it even happened. We called it torture. It was torture and in the end, the United Nations have since called it torture. One guy I know, he got ECT for not eating his vegetables. This person that's giving it to us, it's just... <laughs> just an animal himself, because he even called me an animal. They were allowed to write letters home, but the letters were all um, uh, screened by the staff you got to write your letters in, in English. And he realised that if he drew a picture that showed him as being happy, but wrote something that actually told his family what was happening... Better put it in the happy face way. Don't draw it properly, just scribbling it up and let it go through. It was almost like some guy in a I'm in prison of a war camp sort of getting the, getting the message out. Oliver was very adept at forming relationships with journalists like Peter Trickett at the Herald. It's all very well writing a letter to the minister, but they can bin that. Um, it's a little harder to ignore when you've got this splashed on the front page of the New Zealand Herald. We were exposing the embarrassing facts. I mean, look at how terribly the state cared for the children that it took into their care. Watching a cordman action and seeing the things that they did, I knew that they'd become targets, like we were. The Parkers would have felt that he's betrayed them. I was breaking ranks. Dr Sutherland of the Department of Scientific Research is not supposed to stand up and say these sort of things. And so for that reason, of course, the politicians uh, really, they detested me. The Minister of Social Welfare, Bert Walker, said that, that the only people that were damaging these children was Dr Sutherland of Accord by making these cases public. The government perception of me was that I was a troublemaker, I was an activist, I was, I was a protester. And that led to anonymous letters that we got, the nigger lover type things. And graffiti on the, on the fence, and it was full on, very full on. You know, just scratched the surface and all this hate and stuff come out and Whoa! The butcher in, up in Ponsonby wouldn't serve us. We weren't popular, let's put it that way. May 18th, 1974, that house got raided by police. And I think, how come Palangi people get raided by the police for standing up for us? We were being watched from the early 70s right through the next 15 or so years by the SIS who were gathering information on every meeting that I went to. Yeah, there were certainly strange noises on the, on the phone every time you, <laughs> you answered it, yes. <laughs> it must have been quite uh, discouraging, this great war that he encountered 
from the institutions. Well, there were hardships but, and there were some successes, but it was more than 10 years full on struggling to work for change in a society that was not very willing to change. There were a lot of kind of defeats, if you like. He didn't get the result he wanted. When you looked at us politicians, I mean, you knew nothing was ever, it wasn't going to change. Accord came to an end in 1986. Racism's a pretty stubborn beast, as uh, I'm pretty sure Oliver would agree with that. In Ohotato, please be seated. Well, Madam Chair, here we are after 45 years. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, late, uh, but it's never too late for justice. Um, Oliver's evidence is just rock solid. It's, it's irrefutable, you know. Nobody was looking except the social welfare officers. Nobody was looking when the eight-year-olds were dragged through the courts to face some charge or another. That information is now a crucial body of evidence. You know, he has laid a foundation for the inquiry's work, basically. That's when they put the um, electorate on my head. From 1970 to 1986, I personally advocated on behalf of scores of children whose cases I drew to the attention of one cabinet minister after another. Didn't matter whether they were Labour, didn't matter whether they were national, they weren't really interested. The department was rejecting it. Robin Wilson said it was untrue. Well, what he was saying was that the children were untrue. These kids have been told to shut up, you're liars, you're this, you're that. And his account and his meticulous record keeping has given them this independent voice that said, this happened, I believe you. And for survivors, that's an incredibly powerful thing. Of course, they've never been believed, ever. We can't thank Oliver enough for the work he's done for Te Ao Māori. Dr Sutherland, I have no question for you, but I was struck by the fact that you said at the beginning of your evidence that no one was looking. And I want to thank you for looking. Mm. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> My friend is a doctor of bugs and insects. He helps me feel less like one of society's rejects. He showed me friends can come from all walks of life to help carry burdens and comfort strife. He helped bring out the best in me, and even in prison, my spirit is free. It's real